What is autism? I was diagnosed as autistic in the 1980s. Not autism spectrum disorder, because that wasn't in the diagnostic manuals just yet. Just autism. The next 15 years or so were spent in an often fruitless and frequently soul-destroying search to find out what my diagnosis meant. The world is very different now. The autism spectrum has been in the ICD and the DSM since the early 90s, and there are autism charities in every county and big city in the UK. Most people have at least heard of autism now, and there are people who have recognised they may be autistic themselves thanks to the greater availability of information. However, the question of what is autism remains one most people can't answer. It's a question I've asked hundreds of people in the last 30 odd years, and the responses vary from the clinical to the emotional and from the astute to the ridiculous. These days, when someone can't be bothered or isn't able to answer a question, they'll often tell you to just Google it. So let's start there. The first page of a Google search gives us a few charities telling us it's a lifelong disability featuring deficits in communication, social skills and behaviour, along with the NHS pointing out it's not an illness. When we look on Bing, we find much the same sources, along with a quote from a dictionary. Noun. A developmental disorder of variable severity that is characterised by difficulty in social interaction and communication and by restricted or repetitive patterns of thought and behaviour. There's also a number of disturbing adverts from commercial companies about early intervention. What about Wikipedia then? As the People's Encyclopedia, perhaps we'll see something different there. Autism is a developmental disorder characterised by difficulties with social interaction and communication and by restricted and repetitive behaviour. So, we're getting a pretty clear picture. Almost everywhere we look, we're seeing the same themes. Bear in mind we're not delving very deep, but sadly neither do a lot of people. That's if they even get as far as looking something up on the internet rather than believing what they see on TV or what their friends tell them. Unfortunately, when you do go deeper, the picture doesn't get any more optimistic. When you read the descriptions of autism on the pages of charities, uh, medical authorities and in the news, it's dominated by words like deficit, challenges and problems. This gets even worse when you look at the definitions from those with a vested interest in autism. The private companies that make fortunes out of peddling interventions and therapies that have been unequivocally proven to be ineffective and even harmful paint an even bleaker picture. The uh, blogs and videos from attention seekers and anti-vax cranks come out with wildly inaccurate statistics about autism prevalence and the incidence of additional disabilities. Some of them will even suggest that things like seizures, uh, violence and incontinence are symptoms of autism. The one thing that unites all these definitions of autism is who wrote them. They were all written by non-autistic people trying to define us from the outside looking in. Autism in dictionary terms is based on external observations of autistic people, not by autistic people describing our own experience. Imagine, as many writers have done in the past, how an alien species might describe humanity. The commonly expressed opinion is that they wouldn't think very much of us. They might comment on our fragile bodies, our limited senses uh, and our rather pitiful number of limbs and fingers. 
They may make moral judgments about us, arguing and fighting with each other. Our inability to trust, the fact that we lie, cheat and steal, even kill each other. They might call us irresponsible, even idiotic, for destroying our environment or genocidal maniacs for having killed off so many of our native species. The consensus is that they would not look on us as equals, let alone hold us in high regard. They wouldn't see the joy we share together, the euphoria of a crowd at a concert or a sporting event, the deep bonds of love between a parent and child or the beauty of music or art. They wouldn't appreciate our ingenuity or our spirituality, our desires to um, improve and better ourselves. They may only see where we fail by their standards, not where we succeed by our own. There have been other examples where fictional aliens have lived among us and have seen past their species instincts to destroy or ignore the people of Earth. By living with us, they've developed a deeper appreciation of the positives of human society. But even then, they've remained alien. They may have a fascination, even affection for us, but they still do not understand us. I may be talking about fictional explorations of the theme, but they still hold a valuable lesson. Any definition of a people or a subgroup within those people will always be lacking if it's written by someone outside that group. The dry dictionary definition teaches us very little. The dictionary tells me that homosexuality is being attracted to one's own gender. But that tells me nothing of what it's like to actually be gay, of how one's experiences, feelings or motivations may differ to someone who is not. Even then, that definition is a step forward from those who would have read a century or two ago. Then you wouldn't find it in many dictionaries, and what definitions you would find would be in religious texts, medical journals or legal precedents. The very idea that being gay would one day be accepted and that gay marriage would be an everyday occurrence would have been unthinkable in the mainstream. When I was a child, I was given old British encyclopedias bought in jumble sales that still talked of empire and described people from the colonies as being uncivilised savages were it not for the influence of white rule. These early 20th century encyclopedias were the internet of their day and were taken as gospel truth by most people who read them. White heterosexual people were led to believe by all the organs of authority that they were superior to those who weren't. The dictionary definitions of autism as we see them today are no better informed than those old encyclopedias because like them, they're written by outsiders with little consideration for the thoughts, feelings and experiences of the people they define. Autism was originally defined less than 80 years ago and even without input from knowingly autistic people has gone through many changes since. The internet has been a game changer for autistic people the world over. When I was younger we were isolated from each other. It was incredibly rare for two diagnosed autists to be in a room together and even then it was only likely in a clinical setting or an institution. The internet has allowed us to share our commonalities and discuss our differences. We've gone far beyond the medical definitions of externally observed behaviours to understand why we might be different. We've explored our feelings and our thought processes. We shared our sensory experiences and the way we express ourselves. We've learned to understand common motivations or reactions to external factors. What we've learned has been in equal parts 
joyous revelation and crushing disappointment. We discovered that we shared a need to be honest and truthful, which we were told was communication deficit. We learned that we tend to be consistent in our thoughts and feelings, but when we asked it of other people, they often refused and called us inflexible. We talked of how our senses varied, about synesthesia and hypersensitivity, of hyposensitivity and interoception, and realised that few of us were ever believed, sometimes even punished for sensing or not sensing as others do. More and more, we began to understand that what many of us experienced was common enough to meet the social definition of normal within our own community. We're not faulty humans. We are humans who think, feel and express ourselves in a slightly different way. And we were born that way. Most of us realised that the main reason we were unhappy and felt disabled was down to the way we're treated, not because of the way we think, behave or communicate. It's common for us to feel misunderstood, misrepresented and not listened to. We've grown accustomed to being treated as second-class human beings, even when we have prodigious skills, empathy and talent on display for all to see. Just like the Victorians thought of being gay as a matter for priests, practitioners or policemen, the people of today think of autistic people as being deficient in the essential qualities of humanity. Which is why asking the question, what is autism, of anyone who is not autistic themselves, is likely to be filled with talk of deficit and failure. So, what kind of answer do you get from autistic people? The jury is still out on that one. Friends and colleagues of mine have put together various works in progress on the subject. One of the best I've seen is the communal definition of autism being compiled by the Autistic Collaboration Trust, of which I'm a member, um, although I haven't directly contributed to it myself. I'll put a link to it in the description. Most autistic people consider being autistic as disabling in modern society. How much of that is down to our inherent differences and how much due to our treatment is a subject of much debate. You'll even find a few outliers who deny autism is a disability in any form, which is an opinion they're entitled to have, though they are far rarer than the parties who profit from demonising autistic voices and writing would have you believe. Some will say it's a gift, and a few will say it's a curse. Most of us recognise that whilst we are defined by society as deficient, we also benefit from strengths that are rarely acknowledged. Our spiky skill sets are made up of talents we are especially strong in, along with others we may require some support with. We know ourselves to be specialists rather than generalists. We're often emotional people, with deep connections to others that may be overwhelming when ignored, and we care deeply about those around us. We share a desire to love and be loved, along with a need for concentration and internal reflection. Ask a hundred different autistics the question, what is autism? And you'll get a hundred different answers. Not because we disagree on the defining behaviours that made autism a diagnosis in the first place, but because we each have our own intimate, personal understanding of why we are seen to behave that way in the first place. Many of those reasons would no longer exist if only we were understood and accepted as just being different instead of deficient. There's a phrase you'll come across over and again in autistic circles. 
If you've met one autistic, you've met one autistic. Because for all we have in common, we are all unique. The mythical alien we spoke of earlier could live in a human body for a thousand years, read every piece of literature, listen to every symphony and opera, and appreciate every movie and artwork, yet still not understand what it is to be human. If you want an answer to the question, what is autism? then don't look to dictionaries or medical manuals. Don't talk to doctors, academics or charities. Especially don't look to anyone who makes a profit out of treating autism. Ask an autistic, then ask another and another and keep on asking. Then maybe one day you'll get close to having an answer. Thank you for watching. If you want to see more films on autistic life, then click on the logo on the left to subscribe, or on the right to go straight to another autistomatic film, or visit autistomatic.com.